everyone. Um, my name is Jane Smith. I'm deputy leader of Animal Welfare Party um, and the UK's first ever elected political representative with uh, a mandate to represent the interests of animals as well as humans. So that said, obviously I'm very happy to be speaking here at VegFest. I feel amongst friends and walking the halls I know that I've got a lot of common interests and aims with people here. But there's a little bit of a conundrum because I'm here as a political representative working on behalf of animals and my conundrum is that veganism is growing so fast here in the UK, it's huge now, and yet we're one of the tiny political parties um, in our political landscape. I'm wondering why is that? Because we work so hard for animals, including for veganism and for the environment. I do think I know what the problem is, and I think the problem is politics itself. Some of you here might vote for one of the mainstream parties, and you might indeed be actively lobbying your parties for better representation of um, animals and their rights. If so, well done, that's fantastic. Some of you might be people who were able to in fact vote for Animal Welfare Party in the last election. We did field candidates. We'd like to field more. Um, some of you might not vote as a matter of principle. You might feel disgusted by politics generally, in which case, uh, I would say I don't blame you. Uh, or you may feel unrepresented, which is something I hope in some way to be able to change your mind about. I'm here to challenge your way of thinking about politics and hopefully in a really constructive way, given where we are. But firstly, a bit of an admission. Uh, I'm a local politician myself, but I do understand why politics and politicians are kind of dirty words to a lot of people and on the face of things to be honest even though I'm in it they're a bit of a dirty word for me too. Um, I would say that politicians and their parties are obsessed with majorities aren't they? Majorities to form governments, to form coalitions, to get policies pushed through. But there's something really wrong with this picture of human politics because they're focused on majorities, but we humans are in fact by no means the majority, are we, in the world in which we operate. Uh, if we take the wide view, or perhaps the fair view, it's very obvious that we need to start thinking pretty differently. Uh, recent research by a group of international scientists led by Professor Ron Milo of the Weizmann Institute shows that the 7.6 billion humans worldwide actually account for only 0.01% of life on Earth. I think it's worth saying that again. Humans represent only 0.01% of life on Earth. But all of our mainstream politics represents human interests almost uniquely. So why is that? Just because someone or something doesn't vote, why should that mean that we mustn't include its interests in our human decision-making? It's human decision-making through governments and corporations that has such a huge and often devastating impact on everything else. So for me, and for the global movement of animal rights parties, which includes ourselves, the obvious thing would be to make sure that in our human processes, we demand fair representation of all the other living things on Earth as far as is humanly possible. Much more is possible and we should be up to the job. So that's why I say we need a regime change because it's time to end what you might call the dictatorship of the 0.01% and start to represent fellow species in our human processes. Let's have a think though about how we got to this point of humans uber alles. This can't have happened by accident after all. <coughs> the situation is dire. 
If aliens came and did to the Earth what we humans and so-called civilization are currently doing, we'd see it as a situation of all-out war and would respond accordingly. But when it's us doing it, where does that leave us? Why is this happening? Because no one grows up wanting to wreck the only planet that we can call home. Albert Einstein made a really interesting point about human hubris. He said that humans experience themselves as somehow separated from all the other species. He called it a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. He then went on to say that this optical delusion is a kind of prison for us, which limits our affection, care, and concerns to just a few people around us. He summarized by saying that our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Humans generally act as though they feel answerable to other humans only. And this is very much amplified in politics, I think. Politicians act as if they're answerable only to voters and to other human influencers, including corporations, of course. And this is essentially how human politics is conducted. Here's another thought, which I hope isn't too unsettling, or perhaps I hope it will be unsettling, do we really live in a democracy? Before we sort of gasp at that idea, uh, to answer it honestly and openly, we might also want to ask, do our governments better serve living things or corporations? Because if the answer is corporations, then I'm afraid we're not living truly in a democracy. So what can we do when, as an Earth Day poster way back in 1971 put it, We've met the enemy, and it's us. Well, we've got to demand that other things are put on the table instead of the nonsense that does currently pass for politics. And I'm suggesting that we've got something really important to put on the table, something where the interests of everything and everyone coexist. A picture of the Earth, it's our home, it gives us all life, but somehow, it's easy to take all that for granted. And the Earth is, of course, present for itself, as opposed to for human use above all else. But we've regarded the Earth as a thing for human use for quite some time now. And that line of thinking is certainly encouraged by society, and most definitely by modern economics. This idea of human dominion over the Earth is actually a fairly recent construct in human history, but it's become a very compelling, all-encompassing, and disproportionately powerful idea because our economic systems are absolutely based on it. We could take, for example, what's happening to the bees and to insect life in general. Industrial agriculture is humanity's favored form of food production. It uses pesticides with the intention of increasing crop yield and therefore profits, knowing full well that we're waging a war on insects and endangering human lives at the same time. And a third of all the food we eat depends on pollinating insects. We're living in an age of reckless consumerism. I would call it consumerism as vandalism focused on having instead of being. That's our cultural narrative today, and it's a shockingly poor one. But the truth is, and in fact the good news is, to take a Beatles song and change it a little bit, all you need is less. Because perpetual economic growth is of course a myth, but it's a myth that's become rooted into the fabric of our society. Back in the 1930s, Aldo Leopold said that human society had become a kind of hypochondriac, so obsessed with its own economic health as to have lost the capacity to actually remain healthy. D.H. <coughs> Lawrence also wrote something quite beautiful about our insane disconnect with nature. He wrote, we are bleeding at the roots because we're cut off from the earth and the sun and the stars and the poor blossom we plucked it from its stem on the tree of life, 
and we expected it to keep on blooming in our civilised vase on the table. Since the beginning of human civilization, 83% of wild mammals and half of the world's plants have been exterminated through human intervention. What's civilized about that? Another scary thought, Western humans now recognize fewer than 10 plant types on average, but over 100 corporate logos. It's a sad state of affairs and we need to do something about it. One of the logos that most of us recognize, even <coughs> us people here at VegFest, is KFC. So let's talk about chickens just for a moment, because it's a really good example of how human politics and e economics puts humans first. In fact, they treat humans and wealthy humans at that as the only game in town. First off, a little reminder, all chickens are descended from the jungle fowl of Southeast Asia. They are meant to forage the floor of the forest, dust bathing in forest materials. Chickens were wild jungle birds, and what we think of today when we think of chickens that, that are farmed animals, they're descended from jungle fowl. Incidentally, I like to use the term farmed animals with an ED at the end rather than farm animals because I think we need to emphasize that being farmed is something that's done to these animals rather than something that they were born for, which of course none of them should be. But back to chickens. Prior to the Second World War, most were in fact kept for their eggs. But in the post-war years, governments were really keen to get cheap food onto people's tables. And to this end, in 1948, the US Department of Agriculture organized a contest called Chicken of Tomorrow to get farmers to breed birds that could compete ounce per dollar with pork and with beef. The chicken that won that competition was a Cornish, New Hampshire crossbreed. Almost all of today's broiler or meat chickens worldwide, including the one billion that are slaughtered each year here in the UK, are descended from that bird. And fried chicken is now the world's second most popular fast food after burgers. In Eating Animals, Jonathan Safran Foer wrote that KFC is arguably the company that's increased the sum total of suffering in the world more than any other in history. A new KFC opens somewhere every seven hours. And across the chicken meat industry, birds are slaughtered each year in their billions, almost all of them, of course, on factory farms. This also makes chickens the most numerous bird in the world. Actually, farmed poultry now represent 70% of all birds on Earth. Professor Jan Zalciewicz at the University of Leicester sees factory farm chickens as important evidence for the new human-dominated Anthropocene. If future humans were to search the Earth for fossils from the early 21st century, they'd find fossilized factory farmed chickens in every rubbish dump and on every street corner pretty much around the world. Why can't mainstream politics and governments fix this situation where billions of birds spend their short lives in unimaginable misery to become low quality, in fact dangerous food for humans who could be eating more healthily, more humanely and at a much less devastating environmental cost? The short answer, of course, money but money enabled by politics. Multinational food corporations, animal feed conglomerates, and supermarkets are some of the world's most important financial players. That's why governments listen to them. That's why their needs are absolutely catered for by our mainstream parties and by our governments. They daren't tackle those who pollute our air and water and who profit from billions of individual animals' pain on factory farms. And let's not forget either that our economic ideas do in fact come from cultures with a very long history of violence. And violence is of course still very much explicit 
in our extractive economies where we take and take and take by wrenching profit from the earth and its living beings. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can do things differently. In 2006, for the first time in history, a political party was elected into a national parliament that declared the interests of non-human animals as the starting point for their philosophy and policies. This was Partij voor de Dieren, Party for the Animals in the Netherlands. Having gained seats at local council level some 10 years earlier, PVDD made history by having two elected MPs representing non-human animals in a national parliament. They now have over 50 councillors, five members of parliament, two senators, and one member of the European Parliament. What does that mean in practical terms? It means that very pressing issues around factory farming, for example, are very regularly tabled in the Dutch Parliament, which means that laws can get proposed and passed that improve the lives of farmed animals and others. Here's Esther Ouvrand, one of PVDD's five MPs, asking the Dutch Parliament how it's possible to humanely, in inverted commas, slaughter an animal that doesn't want to die. Because no animal wants to die, since every animal's life is as important to them as ours is to us. I think we all know that here, but how often do we hear our politicians say it? Party for the Animals are able to use expressive politics to bring to the fore issues that are routinely swept under the carpet by mainstream parties. Who do we have in our parliament standing up to show photos of animals about to be slaughtered? No one, because there isn't a single politician in our parliament whose party wants to represent the interests of non-human animals. It's important to point out that the Netherlands enjoys a fairer electoral system than the UK, proportional representation. We don't have that here, and what a surprise, none of the mainstream parties are campaigning for a fairer system. It suits them that we have an electoral system that only really allows entry to the juggernauts. And yet, Animal advocacy parties are one of the fastest growing political movements worldwide, with 19 parties all over the world. Animal Welfare Party is just one of them, but we also have colleagues in Moldova, Canada, France, Spain, Portugal, Germany, Sweden, Finland and Colombia. This is a global movement based on protecting the interests of the weakest against the alleged rights of the strongest. We want to give a voice to the 99.99%, but we also believe that giving a voice to the other 99.99% is also in the interests of us, the 0.01% human minority. It's a win-win situation. Last year, I made UK political history in becoming the first elected councillor for Animal Welfare Party, with a mandate to do precisely that, to give a political voice to the other 99.99%. I work at the town council level in Cheshire, and even in the short time since last year, we've been able to bring significant progress in improving lives locally. And my experience there very much tells me that when we do take steps to really improve the lives of other species, our own lives are also really improved and enriched. Let me give you one example. One of the huge problems facing wild animals in towns like mine is the lack of access to habitat for foraging, mating, <coughs> nesting and hibernating. A huge contributor to this problem has been the widespread paving over of gardens and the use of walls and fences instead of hedging. Of course, I knew that many species were in decline in part because of this. 
one day I came across a beautiful toad that had been run over and I knew that the houses either side of the road had both got ponds and that the toad would have been trying to get to water but that the gardens which had solid walls around them meant the toad had to crawl down the road instead. I thought about this for some time wondering whether solid walls were anything I could actually do anything about at council level. I knew that something that was meant to help toads might not be an obvious crowd pleaser among council colleagues. I love them, but they're not everybody's favorites. I also knew that one of the other species most affected by walled properties was hedgehogs, one of the most popular animals in our country. I realized that my council colleagues probably wouldn't want to be seen to oppose something that was intended to help hedgehogs, the nation's favorite. So with an idea born from toads, but which would help all types of small animals, I put together what I called a hedgehog's motion, asking the town council to stipulate that wildlife tunnels be included in any new walls or fences in our locality. <coughs> My hedgehog's motion was passed unanimously this March, making our town the first in the UK to have a specific planning requirement that anyone from a house owner to a huge developer, anyone building a new wall or solid fence has to include wildlife tunnels every 10 feet. It's a really small and inexpensive measure, but one which will make an incredible difference for very many wild species on our doorstep. It was also a popular move with positive national media coverage and over 30 other councils have now approached me to ask for uh, the motion so that they can do it in their area too, which I'm really pleased about. But it does beg the question, seeing as it's so easy, why hasn't such a simple and popular thing been done before? Hedgehogs have been in decline for decades. <coughs> the answer is, no mainstream politician will prioritise their influence to improve things for non-human animals. Even hedgehogs don't vote. Human planning systems and rampant development have decimated hedgehog populations for decades and it felt really good to be able to bring in a measure that would make sure hedgehogs and other animals' needs would be considered in human planning applications going forward. Animal focus parties can do this and in bringing in measures that cater for the interests of other species, we introduce a much wider ethos of caring for the planet and for taking our rightful place at the table as one species among the many, and as a species that can and will accommodate the interests of other species. There's so much we can do politically, even at this, the most local level, to dramatically improve things for other living beings. And in practically every case, there will be hugely positive outcomes for humans at the same time. When human decision-making involves thinking of ourselves as part of a larger us, situated in a longer now, coming from a deeper past, and moving towards a much better future, I think that's when we can be at our real best. This is why we need to represent the rights and needs of other animals in our human processes at every political level. Animal exploitation is huge. The world is more or less built on it, not least most economies. It does sound like an insurmountable problem. But let's not be too daunted. The global economy was once built on human slavery. And when a few brave people first started talking about abolishing slavery, they were laughed at. In animal rights, we need to build the kind of mass movement that in the past created the political space to end transatlantic slavery. We've got to create that political space for animals. Animal exploitation has to end, and for so many reasons, we can't begin to list them here. You people at VegFest know this, but our mainstream politicians even those few who might feel the same, 
won't do anything about it because they're concerned with votes and with towing their party lines. It's left to us to be smart. We have to effect real change for animals and for us, in other words, for 100% of living beings. Some of that change will come about through changes in social attitudes and in public opinion. Some of it will come from necessity. Climate change and its horrors will force change quickly, although it may well be too late. But what is also crucial is that we shake up our political system by demanding that not just the interests of the 0.01% are catered for. We have to demand that the other 99.99% of life on Earth be fairly represented. Even though our unfair electoral system is against us, we have to force change through representation for animals at every political level, starting with the parish councils and the town councils, working through to borough councils and standing for parliament. It's so important to get the word animal onto those ballot papers. We have to make our decision makers see that we do care about things beyond the narrow confines of the human minority. Obviously, we need members. So think about joining us or one of our sister parties overseas. We also have associate membership where you can be a member of another political party while showing that you agree with our aims. It's a huge part of our work, especially somewhere like the UK, to put pressure on the mainstream parties to raise their game in terms of animal-related policies. Our other policies aside, we're the only UK party demanding a transition to plant-based agriculture, which makes sense on so many levels. All of our aims and our policies aim to show that an end to animal exploitation also opens up human wealth, the real wealth of being a responsible species in a shared world. We need animal welfare party candidates in parishes, towns, borough council elections. So if you're interested, talk to us about standing in your area. Our party leader is here today as well. Wouldn't it be great to have the word animal on ballot papers across the UK? including where you live. Animal exploitation isn't there by accident, and it won't end by us asking nicely. We have to physically show that we mean business and that we're prepared to fairly represent the interests of 100% of the world's living beings. Robert F. Kennedy said that each time a person stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, they send forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression. Animal exploitation is huge, but it's not an insurmountable problem. We can do it. We have to fight animal oppression by standing up and representing animals in our human decision making. We should be up to it, and anything else just isn't good enough. Thank you.